Live from the MGM Grand Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Q at Splunk.com 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Splunk. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Kelly. Thank you very much. So um, we just got back from the keynote, but obviously security, what a great story uh, you were hearing here. You know, using big data, um, prevent, looking at patterns, preventative, but also taking actionable ins actions out of the insight. So um, let me get your take on that. I mean, what are you guys doing with security and what's your general view of security evolution or transformation? Sure. Um, well, you know, what you see now is just it, so many different threat vectors that people are coming in. And you've got a multitude of tools that allow you to look at this problem or this threat or what's going on here. And um, when you look at the different, um, when you look at the different threat vectors and how these all tie together, you need a tool like Splunk where you can bring it all together and understand what's going on. So Jeff, what's your take on this thing? Well, so clearly, the, the, we've heard today from a few of the uh, uh, Cube guests that security, you know, security threats are evolving. It's a never-ending challenge, right? As soon as you figure out one way to stop a, a particular security vulnerability, the hackers, the, the, the perpetrators figure out a new way to get into your system. Exactly. Um, so talk a little bit about that evolving landscape and how Splunk's helping you kind of keep up. Sure. So one of the things that we find is while a single point tool can tell you a piece of the story, it's not until you know everything that you can really figure out whether an incident is over. So I'll give you an example. One of the, uh, we have an acquired division, so we have two different divisions, both of which got hit by a piece of malware. And in the first, set, uh, the first company that we dealt with, that, that we didn't have Splunk. And so what you find is you're constantly searching for data. So you're going to one group and saying, hey, I need mail logs, right? Another group, you're saying, I need proxy logs. You're going to a different group to get network information. And so when we reacted to that piece of malware, it took us three days. And each day, my boss would come to me and says, what's the chance that we're going to deal with this tomorrow? And I said, pretty hot. Now, when we brought that same problem, that we had the same problem on a different network that was all fully under Splunk, my security team was able to fully diagnose and get to root cause within three hours. So not only knowing who was infected, what happened, but where did it come from and how did it enter the organization? We were able to close that off and then also go back to every individual who also had that same email, so it came in through an email. Mm -hmm. We found everybody who had that email, we were able to delete it and talk to those people and make sure that they understood not to click it, et cetera. So, so why is, let's drill into that a little bit. So sure. why was Splunk able to do that, whereas the previous method was not? Is it because Splunk has a systems-wide view um, or because it brings everything into that single pane of glass. Mm -hmm. So for us, we needed to look at proxy logs, mail logs, uh, network logs, and some of our application logs and bring those all together. So when we looked at it in Splunk, you could just go from one query to the next. So you could look at an IP address and put that into a search criteria and see everything that affects that IP address. Mm -hmm. Or you could look at a mail subject and say, show me everybody who's seen this mail. Or show me everyone who's, you know, of these five people, what's similar? Mm -hmm. right, so we had five people that got infected. We didn't know exactly where it came from, so we said, we were able to go into Splunk very quickly and say, look across these five people and what mail did they receive that was similar? And so we found you know, one that you look at and you're like, this doesn't make sense, and it turned out to be you know, a phishing slash mm -hmm. um, attack vector. And we were very, easy, very quickly to say, okay, that's the email. Now, go search all the emails, find everyone with that same subject or that same sender, and pull those people out. And then also go look at the, the links and look at those in the proxy logs. So maybe someone received it through their Gmail or through some other vector, we were able to target that too. And then put it into our block, uh, you know, into all of our blocking mechanisms so that nobody could get to it after we found it. Mm -hmm. But in that case, you know, three hours, the incident's completely over. My boss says, what's the chance of this happening tomorrow? And I said, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. well, right, so. <laughs> well, right, so three hours versus three days is pretty dramatic. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so translate that into the business benefit. Simply, you stop the attack, you stop the whatever damage is being done by the attack. Yep. Um, in certain systems, we had to take offline during the attack. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we had to have our shared drive offline, so it didn't, you know, we didn't take any risk of infection until we knew we had found the root cause. So for three days, we had limited access to important data, mm -hmm. right? 
versus the other case, it was three hours. And even then, it was only an hour and a half because we had known where we came from, and the other hour and a half was cleanup. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, having all that, and that, that was probably one of the best, you know, kind of in the field trenches view where everyone saw the difference because the other thing is everyone gets involved on the first day. Right, so every group had to drop everything they were doing, so everyone in the infrastructure team was dropping everything and being pulled in and out. Versus when we had it in Splunk, the security team could do all the research in the forensics, and then only when we had to take remediation actions involve other teams. Mm -hmm. So it even kept our velocity and our infrastructure group moving forward. Now, looking ahead, so we, we've, we've heard more uh, from Splunk about adding kind of out of the box pattern detection capabilities. Yep. And talked to a few guests today, uh, who talked about, from a security perspective, that's going to be huge. Yes. Um, what is your take on that? B being able to proactively uh, identify potentially threatening or, or security uh, threatening trends uh, out of the box, will that make your job easier? Um, and what, what benefit will that provide? Right, absolutely. So, so we offer both software as a service as well as normal network operations to run. But being a service company, everything has online operations to it itself. Mm -hmm. So every way that we can notice you know, attacks. So we, we listened to the keynote here today and we heard you know, it only gets worse, right? Mm -hmm. The attacks only get stronger, they only come faster. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you can deploy something very quickly for a heart bleed or a shell shock, that you can very quickly detect the signatures or look for you know, what are the attack vectors and very quickly understand all right, what's not patched, what is, and what's coming together. Mm -hmm. You bring those things together, right? So, so the more information I have in one single pane of glass, the, very, the quicker I can put it in front of everybody's face and understand here's what we're trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, is there a way for us to get to the point where organizations are being more proactive around security threats versus reactive to, okay, here's a new security threat, we've got to act to, act, uh, to, to stop it. Right. Uh, is there a way, is, do tools like Splunk or other tools or other approaches going to enable us to get to that point where you're being more proactive or is it always going to be we just got just to wait for the next attack and then hopefully yeah. the tools will get better, we can deal with them faster, right. but I think really you know, we just you have, have that, to wait for the next attack to come. Right, I think you have that mix, right? So there's certain things that, that happen to you or um, that are the zero day attacks that you have to react to. Right, there are things that have just never been known, there are vulnerabilities in software that, that have been detected and you have to react. Um, from a proactive standpoint though, it's how are you, are you patching, right? Do you have, can you tell that you've patched everything, right? So I think from a proactive standpoint, it's getting the reporting that shows me exactly where landscape is, as opposed to, yeah, we run all the, we, you know, all the servers should be patched, the operator, operative word being should, versus putting on a dashboard where you can look at it every day and say, we've got a problem, 10% of the machines are not seeing patches. Right? That's when you go into full reactive mode when you find out that, oh, it's only the, the unpatched machines that are threatened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So help, help me put this, this whole you know, big data movement in perspective. So sure. obviously security is a huge use case and you're having some significant um, success using Splunk and I'm guessing some other, other tools uh, associated with it. Um, but let's take a step back. You know, we've seen this market evolve and we saw in the keynote this morning kind of, I think it was Godfrey who compared kind of the old BI and data warehouse stack to this new, uh, kind of the new approach which allows for more iterative um, schema on read type analytics. Right. How is that playing out in your organization? Do you sure. see a, um, is there a tension between the two approaches? I'm sure you know, you've, you've got a, a robust data warehouse um, a program in place and have for years, I'm guessing. Right. How is that being impacted by these new approaches, not just Splunk, but other things like Hadoop and other more flexible, agile uh, data management approaches? Um, I think they're very complementary. So our, our traditional data warehouse is great for financial reporting and information that's very structured. Right? But then when you start to look at the amount of data flowing through the organization and how you can use it, a, a business intelligence group and a business intelligence, again, understanding all the data before you bring it in, just can't react fast enough, right? So you start to look at just the complete volume of data. So in our case, a great example was our ability to look at customer performance, right? Yeah. So if we look at performance data on what we're seeing, just we get a huge amount of data from our, our web logs and our servers that if we waited to put them into a traditional data warehouse and report them, we'd have to know exactly when we wanted to know before we even started asking questions. Mm -hmm. What we're able to do with Splunk is look at it and say, well, what are our customers seeing? Well, what's this over here? Why is this happening? How do we drill it down? So that information, we didn't even know the question until we started looking at it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's you know, where you see it, it's played out for us very well is our, is our product management, right? Mm -hmm. So 
we can look at and be very proactive. So one of the things that, that I find, you know, and I've talked about before with um, in Splunk sessions, is the ability to be proactive to your customers, right? So corporation service company, service is our middle name. <laughs> and so things happen, right? People write reports that take a very long time, et cetera. And service is whether you can be proactive to those people and help them get better. And so one of the things that we put together is a Splunk dashboard that shows us kind of what we call the pain points of our system for the day. And we can see what pages are running slow, and we can see which customers are most affected. So using some of the DB Connect technology, so we're using old school database technology, mm -hmm. combined with our Splunk technology, we can very quickly go and say, here's all our users, who do they work for, and what companies are they with, but we can very quickly see which companies are having the worst performance on our systems that day. Mm -hmm. We can then call them up and say, I see you're having problems. You know, and the customers are, are like, wow, that's great. And a lot of times it's just coaching. Maybe if we don't write in reports from 1899 to 2014, you know, mm -hmm. we can help your performance increase, right? And so what we found is that we don't even need to drop into software and write systems mm -hmm. to get better performance. Ah, okay. So, but, but to your point about bringing in some of the older technology you've got, it sounds like a key part of this is the integration right. between the systems. So right. people talk about big data and it's going to replace the old, but really it's an integration it challenge. Is. I, I think the, the structured data is there, it's running so many of our systems, right? And so it's bringing that into and being able to join it with all this big data. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're getting all this intelligence and all this information, but how do I now put that back together mm -hmm. with my structured data so that I can report in ways that everybody understands, right? That pulls in the information that I need to get. Scott, I want to get your perspective on, from an industry standpoint, cybersecurity, obviously the keynote here, I uh, was talking about that, obviously big data helps big time, we mentioned that earlier. Well, what's the general sentiment right there? Obviously we had a quote earlier on theCUBE that someone quoted the FBI head that said, there's two types of companies, ones that know they've been hacked by China and two, the ones that don't know they've been hacked by China. So <laughs> right. you know, it highlights this whole cyber warfare, cyber security issue. So what's, the, what's your take on it? And what's the general sentiment inside the security industry? Like people pound on the tables and you know, obviously red alert, what, are, what kind of, uh, uh, what's the general sentiment? Sure, and I think we heard that in the keynote today, which is, you know, it's getting worse and it'll only get more worse, right? <laughs> you know, it's, so it just yeah. continues to get worse because we've entered, and you know, I thought it was interesting today when, when Mark discussed that, um, that you know, the first, the first uh, salvo was launched in the cyber war, right, which is Stuxnet. And ba basically just kind of open the gate for, we're at war in a technology based way. And in, from a commercial sense, all of, you know, every commercial entity is just a part of America, right? And, and so we have to be, you know, we have to get better at our defenses because it is just, that, that's where we are. What's the general uh, action item people look at? Is it government led? Is it, are we not doing enough there? Is it too slow? Is it just data technology? It's got to be refreshed? What's the general, I mean, remember, you know, the, you know, the year 2000 bug was kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, nothing ever crashed, right? right, right. I mean, they did, but I mean, people moved over, but there's right. a lot of dough was spent on that and energy. Right. Are we in that same kind of uh, inflection point with security, with cyber security? I, I think one of the things that you'll find, you know, you talk about government spend, but also is just finding people that are interested, right? So, so science and technology and engineering and math in yeah. the United States, and everybody wants to go straight for a business degree, right? So we still have to continue to grow computer scientists and security yeah. engineers so that, that we've got the resources here that are interested and trained to, to help us defend. And I got to ask you this one question. What's the coolest thing you've seen that you say, oh, I'm jazzed? Because Splunk's an enabling technology platform. They have tooling, they have a platform, but they're doing some amazing things. But what, what do you like the most about Splunk? Um, what I like about it is you're never quite sure how you're going to see it used. So I've sat through a couple different sessions, so I love the way we use it and, and the new insights it's brought to our business. But I've listened to um, you know, a company that has all their elevators are under Splunk, right? And so they can tell exactly what's going on in an elevator from a central headquarters throughout the world of you know, all their elevators. And just you know, never thought of who, who would um, instrument their elevators. And uh, another good conversation is Comcast using it using Splunk to watch basically what you're watching on TV. And so there's certain analog elements that you can't really monitor, but I can watch your behavior. So if you start and stop and start and stop a video on demand, there's probably something wrong with what you're seeing. So they can watch your key presses and figure out that there's something wrong with what you're seeing. So there's just 
two things that probably when you know Splunk I mean, was first written, no one thought about. Data is a use case. It's one of these use cases where it's in the eye of the beholder, right? I mean, right. everyone's got their own different business, so you can't map on a use case. Right. You kind of and, and it's just this flexibility to how do I look at this data mm -hmm. and what does it mean to me? How do I look at data coming out of a, the Internet of Things, and how do I use that to figure out something different about my environment that I've never had access to before? What does cloud do for our industry? Um, help, hurt, um, look if they got news with Amazon, certainly speeds things up with Splunk, but um, does it open up more security holes or opportunities? <laughs> <laughs> and it depends. So that, that's a great it depends kind of question, because one of the things that, that the cloud opens up is now you've got a central focus of, you know, you, you've got that central company that is worried about how to secure this and how to make it available. Um, so I think that in that one way it makes us more secure. In a, and it allows us to focus more on security than, well let me stand up this piece of hardware, let me stand up yeah. 10 servers and make sure that they're the same image. I can now focus on making sure that my security practices are running well and I'm using the data that are coming out of those servers. It's a function really in my mind of the security is getting worse and getting, becoming more worse because the old way was perimeter based. Set up a perimeter, watch everything inside, hope nothing comes in, right? But right. now with API economy, you have all kinds of apps out there with mobile. Maybe the cloud will be a nice right. reset. And, and, and it's resetting to you, there's no perimeter, right? So the, the kind of the, the thick and crunchy on the outside and the soft and gooey on the inside doesn't work anymore. Yeah. So yeah. if you're talking cloud to cloud to cloud, it really has opened up that pretty much that soft and gooey inside, it has to be a hardened perimeter on every little piece. Yeah, <laughs> everything's a perimeter now, but exactly. I mean, that brings up a good point, that's great insight, and again, you know, we came, we came back from VMworld, that was clear from the enterprises we talked to was, hey, you know, mobile infrastructure, perimeterless IT, this is a whole new shift. <laughs> and it really comes down to culture, people available to work on it, so you, you see those things as, as the legitimate issues, culture and, and people. Absolutely. Um, okay, for, for the young guys out there that are you know, in high school, maybe even elementary school, if they're watching the Cube, obviously, <laughs> um, or for parents or, or teachers, what's the advice you give for the new generation? Because you know, we're seeing, there's a general tech interest from these natives, right? They all have mobile devices, so there's a future crop of computer scientists and engineers out there. What's the advice to the parents and the teachers and potentially to the candidates that you would give to them saying to be a tech athlete or a tech soldier, if you will, what would they need to do? I think it's to become more than just a user of the technology, but to understand it. So to be curious, and one of the things that we talked about today, um, you know, one of the one of the people was speaking says, you know, what do you hire for a Splunk person to do Splunk? And it, it's a um, a complete curiosity, right? So just never wanting to say I, I have enough. And I think that's the same thing with anything with, you know, there's not just using my computer. It's how does it work? How does my phone work? What are the pieces below? So I think it's not just being a user, but really understanding. So my kids, I shut down the Wi-Fi, that's, that's how I get their attention. <laughs> that <laughs> and they figure right. out how to go past the net and go set IP addresses. <laughs> now they get the passwords, now I'm, I'm, I'm locked out. That's so, right, exactly. So again, this new generation, again, great insight. Appreciate you taking the time to come on Inside the Cube, inside the cube here, uh, appreciate it. This is theCUBE, you're watching Silicon Angle's coverage of Splunk here live in uh, Las Vegas. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.